And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Elizabeth Hancock, galactic researcher and author specializing in metaphysics and consciousness. She focuses on the true nature of reality, lost history, secret societies, and our star ancestry. Elizabeth, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Elizabeth, what got you interested in all this stuff? Did you have some sort of spiritually transformative experience? You know, I think I've probably always been interested in this, but, um, you know, like most people, I went into normal society, you know, school and work, and you sort of become, you try and become normal. And um, I sort of forgot, you know, I forgot all about this sort of magical world, you know, spiritual, intuitive world, whatever. Um, and then something happened around 10 years ago. My my mum died and um, I started to hear her voice in my head. And at first I thought it was just part of the grieving process, you know. And um, And then one day my sister was coming to visit and I asked her if she had a message for my sister. And so I heard her voice in my head. And, um, and then I relayed that message to my sister and I won't say what the message is, but it was so powerful. It just stunned her, you know, and she was just amazed. And she just said, oh my God, you know, I'm so glad that you told me that. And it really got me thinking, oh my God, was I actually talking to mum? you know? And then I sort of forgot about that a bit. And, um, and then my daughter, it's like things, things just keep coming back to remind you. If you keep forgetting, it just keeps coming back to remind you. And then my daughter started talking about her past life. And um, I wrote it all down. It's actually in my first, first book. And I wrote it down in there, you know, like she was, and at the same time, she was seeing entities and beings in the house and all sorts of things. And it, it went on. It went on until she was around four or five, and then she stopped seeing or talking about these things. But she had an invisible friend that she had up until she was seven, and now she doesn't see that anymore either. So I started to research it, and I understood, you know, it's brainwave activity. Kids are in the theta brainwave activity until they're seven, and then they, you know, right up until they're 13, some of them and the alpha brainwaves as well. And these are the brainwaves that link us to, you know, the energy field, the quantum field, however you want to describe it. And I went off and I started researching it. And, you know, I just began understanding that we live in a multidimensional reality. And, you know, what we call supernatural is probably multidimensionality. And, um, you know, it just went from there, really. And, you know, then for my next book, I got even more infused um, because I started to feel that my ancestors were trying to tell me something. And that's what prompted the second book uh, for me to write that. I have to have a big passion to be able to research and write these things for such a long time. So it's just gone on from there, really. Well, your second book is not out yet, but it's going to be called Human Origins, The Multiverse, and Our Star Ancestry. And yeah, so exactly. What do you think happened to us? I mean, why have we disconnected from our spiritual roots? I think that what we call spirituality is, I think, multidimensionality. You know, I think that we, we don't just live in one dimension. We live in multiple dimensions. Um, you know, I think that there are, and quantum physics has shown this to be the case, there are multiple realities, infinite realities, Every, when you understand that everything is energy, including us, it really makes you see the world in a different way. We see ourselves as blobs of flesh walking around, you know, doing the rat race, you know, making the dinner. But actually, we're actually living in a holographic universe, a holographic reality. And although it sounds strange, there's a, a lot of evidence to show that we're creating our reality all the time through our thoughts, feelings, emotions. And, um, you know, our mind and our heart together are creating this reality that we see around us. So I don't think that we have necessarily been cut off from spirituality. I think that they, they relabeled it, si science and religion, they split it and they created religion, science. And when I say they, you know, um, I'll come to that later, but 
I think that's what happened is that religion was created to try and, you know, whether it was on purpose or whether it was done to try and make sense of multidimensionality by our ancestors who maybe didn't understand what we were talking about, who knows? But we're now getting this back. Now most people have woken up to religion as being this sort of orchestrated man-made thing that has nothing to do with God. God is our spiritual essence. It is spirituality because, you know, we are spiritual beings. You know, we are God consciousness. We are multidimensional beings. But we just maybe didn't know how to explain this in the past. And religion and explained some explained it in a way for people to understand but now we're moving out of that as we evolve we ascend we're moving into new terminology and we're understanding that everything is energy and you know that i think is what spirituality is what you were just telling me is interesting because i had a guest that was a near-death experiencer and she talked about that we live in some sort of simulation which i think you may be saying but she says that we are constantly creating it and it's exhausting and that's why we don't have much energy to do anything else like have psychic abilities no i, I that's not how i see it but, um, you know, I think we all have our own realities and I think there are multiple truths. I don't think anyone is wrong. I think, you know, it, you, when we feel into our heart, we have to really connect to our truth and our truth lives in our heart. And um, I see it in a slightly different way in that I do think we're in a simulation. I think it's what they call the matrix. There is, I do think that there's a veil of illusion. And um, I think that we're trapped in this, or we were trapped in this 3D matrix. And I don't think that it was necessarily started off as a bad thing. I think it's li literally, it's just creating an environment, you know, for us to learn, experience, explore, have adventures, have challenges, you know, or do all the things that we can do as physical bodies that we can't do when we're pure consciousness. And um, I think something a lot, somewhere along the way, it got a bit, it went a bit wonky. It either got hijacked or it it went wrong. And, you know, we, we, because we are creating it as well. We are creating this collective consciousness together all the time. But lately, we haven't known this. We haven't known that we're collectively creating this world. So I think something maybe went a little bit wrong along the way. And we started to create a reality that we didn't want, but we didn't know how to get back from that. Well, you use the word trapped. Are you saying that we are trapping ourselves here or some other external beings doing it? I think it depends how you look at it. And one of the things that I've learned on my own journey, and believe me, I've been into some dark conspiracy theories, you know, and conspiracy theories are a lot of fun on some level. But on another level, what I'm, un what I'm understanding is that consciousness works with us. And it basically gives us what we expect to, to see. So if we want to see, you know, a dark alleyway to walk down and have that as our life, then that's what consciousness is going to give us. If we want to, you know, sort of see, uh, have a, a great life and really enjoy things and do what we want and have adventures, then that's what consciousness is going to give us as well. So I think it really depends on which way you want to look at it. And, um, and I think everyone, you know, sort of should feel into their own truth and understand, you know, what may have happened. My personal truth is I, I, from my research, I can see that for the past 100 years, 120 years, we have been suppressed. There's no doubt about it because everything has been suppressed. You know, the education system was created in the early 1900s. It's an incredibly limited education system. It doesn't teach even like one twelfth of our actual history, I don't think. Um, the pharmaceutical industry was created. You know, the um, it's when these sort of these these uh, old families, these families that can be traced back to the Lurie family. And, you know, they, they, they now descend into what we call the elites today, but they can, they actually trace their family lines back probably hundreds and thousands of years ago, because they can go back further than the indigenous tribes and the indigenous tribes can go back to 80, 85,000 years ago. So I think that they probably know the nature of reality 
And because they've been around for such a long time, they've probably decided, you know, well, let's just control the world. Let's control it. Let's create money. And money can be traced back to 8,000 years ago, Babylon. Um, you know, that le links to the Sumerians. The Sumerians links to the Anunnaki, which we talk about a lot um, with the Sumerian tablets. So I think, you know, bringing it into modern day, I definitely think that there has been a mass suppression. And because we watch so much TV, it's all been, we've been, our collective consciousness has been moved into this sort of route, you know, that these people want us to go in. All right, if we get to human origins, do you think we're a product of evolution or do you think we've been tinkered by ETs? Well, looking at the physical evidence, there we have um, physical evidence of genetic altering in our DNA. There's no doubt about that. We haven't evolved from apes. We, you know, there, there are big leaps between um, Homo habilis and Homo erectus, and then also between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens. So essentially, our brains grew by 75% between 800,000, 200,000 years ago, which just, that's just not possible for evolution. So either apes were genetically altered and created humans, or when you look at the indigenous tribes, they talk about how we come from the Pleiades. And in fact, I think nearly, I think probably every culture talks about links to the Pleiades. And, um, it's interesting when you look at the some of the, the stories in the Bible, and maybe not stories that made it into the Bible, but other stories, you know, like Enoch and things like this, they talk about our ancestors being luminous and with long flowing white hair and how they lived for a very, very, very long time, as we can see in the Sumerian kings list and, um, you know, and how they, they used to eat the uh, only fruit from the forgotten tree which could be the tree of life. And they talk about um, how the more they became involved in this planet, this earth, they started to become more dense, which of course they're describing frequency. You know, 5D, if they were in 5D, which is space, I understand is 5D, they're dropping down into 3D and they're going to become more dense, heavier because it's lower frequency. And, um, they, they then started to have shorter lives where they, they, they ate the food from the planet and they, you know, they became more physical beings as us. So when you look at those stories, it, it shows a very, very different picture to being evolved from apes. So I think that there are multiple bloodlines and maybe some, you know, were genetically altered from apes, who knows? But I think that there are many, many, many different uh, species and races all living together here. And we come from, I think the idea is, is that we actually come from 22 different species of planet species. And um, I think that makes an awful lot more sense, to be honest, than that we evolved from an ape. It's fascinating that you said space is 5D because many people say that we're going through the ascension and we're going from 3D to 5D. And so to make that leap and say, okay, we're going from a physical world to space. We're just rejoining with the galaxy. That's all. And I think that as we rejoin with the galaxy, we will naturally become 5D again. I don't think that that's necessarily to do with... Um, the heart space and all these sorts of things. I, I do think that we definitely, in order to be, in order to ascend, which I think is actually evolution. You see, I, I see it that our journey, our path, if you like, our spiritual path is all about um, expanding our levels of consciousness. So we don't go up, we actually go out. So at this moment in time, I'm aware of myself. As my consciousness expands, I'm now aware of the room around me. As it expands more, I'm now aware of the planet around me. It expands more, I'm now aware of space around me. So I think it's more like that. That's how I see evolution and ascension. And I think we are expanding our levels of consciousness you know, um, a lot more. Also, our DNA is activating. So we know that with our junk DNA, 
You know, 98% of our DNA is called junk DNA, but it's actually activating. There are signs now that the third strand, the fourth strand, these things that are activating, um, a lot of these strands could also be energetic as well. Um, they must be energetic because energy, physical, physical energy, it's the same. And, um, you know, so as we are connecting more back, back to our original selves, I think that we're connecting back to our original selves before the DNA was taken down, clipped, if you like. And you can see in our brain's potential as well. We're only using 10, 15% of our brain potential. So you can see that our full potential as a species is far more different to, what, to where we are now. And this is changing. This is changing because we're getting light codes coming in from space, from the sun. They now understand, you know, that the, the I think Rupert Sheldrake was talking recently about the sun being a, a, an actual entity. It is a, an entity, a conscious entity of its own, and it's created from plasma. We know that plasma makes up 99% of the universe. And, um, you know, I think that there's, there's a lot of science behind all this now. It's, it's a very fascinating area. But how I see ascension is we're literally just, we're coming, we're coming back to who we are. Do you think the world is not what we think it is? And if so, in what ways? Yeah, I think that we have been stuck into thinking that we are one-dimensional beings living in a one-dimensional reality or world. And I think you only have to look at the, the myths and the legends in our past. You know, look at the abilities that these, you know, these, these ancestors of ours had. And, um, you know, you look at the descriptions that they, that they use to describe these people. And we now look at our world today, you know, and we're living in this, you know, sort of quite boring world, really, where we just go to work and we come home and we sleep and we eat and it's very controlled. And um, I don't think that this is reality. I think this is this is a created reality. Now, whether we created it as a as a human consciousness, maybe as a collective, but I don't think that necessarily we did. I sort of feel that there are some people that understand about energy fields, and they know that if they harness the energy fields, then they can create reality as they want to create it because it's it's all around electromagnetism energy. And I think Vadim Zeland describes it quite well when he uses the term energy pendulums. It's all about energy pendulums and it's who, who has got control of the energy pendulum. So I always think, well, now what we have to do is we have to pull the energy pendulums back in our favor. And that's what we're collectively doing. We're collectively taking back control of our world so that we can start to collectively create the world that we want. And I think that the world was collectively created by other people to create a world that they wanted, one that benefited them. And we could call these the elites or, you know, whatever we want to call them. But that's what our job is now. And that's how I see where we're going now. And as we pull our world back and we um, are able to collectively start creating more, I think we will also start to be able to access more multi-dimensionality multi or the different dimensions around us, which um, I think that's what our myths and legends were probably talking about. Advanced people, advanced technologies. Um, you know, you just look at the symbols, the symbolism in our world. It's, it's just, it's everywhere, you know, and it goes back to the secret societies. The symbolism can actually be traced back to ancient Sumeria. And, you know, again, it's that Sumeria, Babylon thing. And, you know, and it's like these people created this world as they wanted it to be that would suit them and benefit them and sort of forgot to tell us, you know, that energy fields, multidimensionality, forgot to sort of say all this stuff. And instead, we were told that we were apes instead. Thank you for that. <laughs> I totally understand what you're saying about myths and legends. But some people still will just say it's a myth and legend. It's not real. What do you say to that? Okay. Them? Well, let's look at the dragons. So, I mean, I am amazed that, 
you know, these the, these things have been forgotten from our history. I'm amazed they've been erased from our history. You know that Tartaria, the one of the, it's the largest empire, um, larger than you know, the the Ottoman Empire, it's, um, and it was it's coming been completely erased from our history. What land did Tartaria encompass? It took over most of the northern hemisphere. It was huge and vast. And um, Russia, you know, all those sorts of places, but it it essentially was just erased. And it looks like someone lost a war. And then the winners of the war decided that they were going to erase all of this. And I think they're still erasing it. And that makes me, you know, sort of wonder about, well, who won the war? But the... um, Tartaria, so 1771 was the time when the last map of Tartaria appeared in the, I think it was Britannica Encyclopedia or something. But And then ever since then, it was then subsequently taken out of um, future copies. But all the Tartarian maps are actually coming back into play again, and they're being released back into play. Even Putin is putting it back into the history books, and they're teaching it to their children now. You know, so how could an how could an empire that took up the northern hemisphere been forgotten about from our world and relegated as myth and now conspiracy theory? You know, well, if we this get- is not normal. Well, if we get back to dragons, it's fascinating that dragons have are still existing in our myth and legends without any physical evidence of them. I think that we have found physical evidence, and I think it's what we call dinosaurs, actually. And, you know, they we have had dinosaurs just banged home continuously. Everything is dinosaurs. There's a dinosaur movie all the time. You know, everything is dinosaurs. Why are they just going on and on and on about dinosaurs all the time? You know, it's like we can't get enough of dinosaurs. Well, what if dinosaurs, actually dragons were a type of dinosaur, dinosaurs were a type of dragon, and then that explains these physical um, bodies, you know, the, the, the skeleton remains. But also if we look at the, the work of Marco Polo, who lived in China for 17 years, and he describes in his journals how dragons were uh, pets. They were trained by families. They used to pull the uh, the carriages, you know, at the um, special ceremonies and things. And they also people also used to, and I think this is this is the key. People also used to um, perform spiritual unions with them for enlightenment, which shows that that these dragons were highly uh, enlightened creatures. So it may be that these dragons, they were highly enlightened and therefore they're not, they're not in these lower frequencies. They're not existing in these lower frequencies because they don't have to, because they're higher frequency, which means that if they're higher frequency now, then at some point when we are also at that higher frequency, which is happening, the, the energies of the planet are rising, you know, continually every single week, we're shifting. We can see this uh, proof with the Schumann resonance, which has um, doubled in the past 20 years. And I think that as we're raising and we're moving back into 5D, whether that's fifth density, um, fourth density, or five, fifth dimension or whatever, you know, in space, I think we will start to see more of these different things. And from from his journals, it's also very obvious that there were not very nice dragons as well. And so those ones were probably killed because they were probably killing people. But it's all there. It's interesting that you said that because I was wondering if perhaps the dragons were actually benevolent and somehow we've created a narrative that the they were these big, scary, dangerous beasts. Yeah, I think they were both, but I think that they were benevolent. And I think the benevolent ones have probably found a way to move off to, to a different dimension. For, like the Sasquatch, the, the Sasquatch, you know, they they are multidimensional beings. There's no doubt about it. They are able to, to go between dimensions, which is why we haven't discovered them. They use portals in the forests. This, this planet is littered with portals. It is really littered with them. They're all over the place. And... Um, and we can see, you know, that if they are transdimensional, then why why can't the dragons be transdimensional as well? You know, and then 
when we're looking at the fairies. I mean, you, you speak to the, the farmers in Scotland and Wales and Ireland, or Scotland and Ireland, and they're always talking about these fairies, you know, these little people being on their land. But when they try and approach them and speak to them, they disappear like that. And that's because they're able to move into another dimension. And, you know, again, this is all frequency, all frequency. You shift your frequency, you can go into a different dimension. And we just have forgotten how to do this. You know, we don't know how to do it anymore. I was checking out your YouTube channel and I noticed you had a video about how a baptism close a person's third eye. Can you talk about that and tell us how to reopen our third eyes? Yeah. So, and this is, this is actually, I got this from the conspiracy theory world, you know, so who knows if it's actually true, but um, I teach intuitive development to people and I did it with them. And I, you know, I asked them sort of before and after whether they felt any different and whether it made any difference. And, you know, I don't know, they, well, they sort of felt it did, you know, but who knows? Um, but yeah, so with the sign of the cross, you see, now the cross is actually a sacred symbol, but it, I think it was being, it's been hijacked by the church. So when they put the cross on here, they're closing up the penile gland. And we know that fluoride closes up the penile gland as well. And, um, you know, I've always, I've always wondered why do they keep putting fluoride in the, in the water when we know that it's, 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 it's toxic to our body. We shouldn't have fluoride. So, and they're still putting it in the toothpaste. Now there is, there is some little evidence to show that children are better off having fluoride, but you know, little bits, little bits, adults not, you know? So I sort of think to myself, surely they didn't, you know, did they just not know that? Did they really just not know that fluoride, you know, I, I don't know, it's weird. But anyway, if you want to open up your penile gland, you simply do the circle. And this is the Celtic circle. And I actually use this now in my logo. And you just go round. And this is, again, another sacred symbol. So it's using, again, the symbols. You know, we know that symbology is a massive part of our world. We can see the elites, the Freemasons, the Illuminati. They all use symbols. That's how they recognize each other. That's how they communicate with each other. And, you know, I think it's no accident, you know, that, that these symbols, that they're using the sacred symbols that the, the ancients used to use. When you're going around in a circle, does it matter whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise? I actually don't know, but I don't think so. I don't see why it would. Maybe just do the, do the way that feels right for you, you know? Again, I think we are all individual. We're all unique. We all have unique fingerprints, you know? And um, I think because of that, we all have to find our own path, which again, is, a, is another sort of evidence of the fact that we're here to have an adventure, to learn, to experience, and it's going to be unique. Everyone's adventure is unique from everyone else. In fact, it even says in the Emerald Tablets the, um, that this is the uh, Thoth Atlantean Emerald Tablets, it, Tablets. It actually says that consciousness essentially creates each world that each world will then live out their own unique reality because this is how consciousness learns. And I think this is where this idea came from, that, that consciousness is experiencing reality through us. I think it comes from that book and possibly other ancient texts as well that say that, that so in order for consciousness to learn, it makes sense that we're all having unique experiences. Otherwise, it's learning the same thing, you know, 8 billion times. Consciousness wants to learn through us 8 billion different ways. But you would think with 8 billion people and coming back over and over again, it should have learned everything by now. Like, you would think there would be an yeah. end point and we would go on and do something else. Well, you know what? It's just a continual. And I have, I have come across one thing with my research in that even ETs or some ETs don't know what consciousness is. They say that it's just an energy source that is just continually creating and they don't even know how to stop it. It's just continually creating. And I think that's where the idea comes from with quantum physics, that it's infinite. There's no beginning. They've discovered there's no beginning. There's no end. And, you know, it's just continuous. And I think maybe we don't know how to stop it. 
And I think maybe there are some people that would love to jump off this train, you know, that we call life. <laughs> um, but I also think that things will get better. I do think that we've been suppressed for 120 years. There's just too much evidence of this to, 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 to think that we haven't. And now that we're not being suppressed anymore, the matrix is lifting. We're able to leave the planet now. We don't have the karmic cycle going on. I think that things are definitely starting to improve. I can feel things are improving. Can you? Yes, I can. Yeah, I definitely feel a big shift. I definitely feel things have shifted. And it, I'm not alone in my thinking in that. And I know, you know, I can see, you can see the evidence with the Schumann resonance, you know, with the, the light codes. Um, you can just see it all around. And it feels different. It feels different. So do you think it's a group of families that run the planet? Or do you think potentially there are ETs above them that are directing these families? Well, it looks very possible that um, this, these, this group of families actually did a deal with malevolent ETs in the 1940s. And it was around the time of World War II. And, um, you know, from the research that I've been doing, it looks very likely that that's what they did. And possibly they were being naive. Maybe they already knew them. Maybe they were connected with them already. You know, who knows? But they definitely started working with them then. But at the same time, different factions of the, the army, the navy, they started working with benevolent ETs at the same time. So we've actually been working with benevolent ETs again since the 1930s, 1940s, and um, malevolent ETs as well. And they've sort of been on this planet and they've sort of been having a big war. You know, this it's just been going on for decades and decades. And when you look at, we can see that there's been a new terror every decade going back to 1900 which is again why I say, you know, 120 years of suppression. And also Dr. Stephen Greer, he was also talking about, and think his, his latest um, webinar that he's doing, he says the, a, a century of technology lost because we, because we have been suppressed since 1900, we have essentially lost 120 years of um, superior technology. If we hadn't been suppressed from that point, then it would our world would be so different by now. I think that this world just isn't what we have been told it is at all. And yeah, maybe there have been malevolent ETs in that. Maybe we certainly have all this advanced technology that is off-planet technology. We do we do not have the ability to create this. And I think the the most interesting example of this is the Billy Meyer case, who was contacted by the Pleiadians in, the, in 1975. And he was actually, he, he had all these images and videos, but he also was given a piece of metal. And they took this metal, um, I think it was Britt Elder and her husband, Lee, I think it was, they took this metal mm -hmm. and they got it analyzed by Dr. Marcel Vogel from IBM. And they discovered that it was not only a cold fusion metal, which they couldn't do at that time, but it also contain, it contained a, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, like beginning like luthium or something, but it contained a property which is very rare on our planet. And we wouldn't have had the ability to be able to, you know, extract that and then turn it into a metal without heating it. It wasn't heated essentially. So that shows that this is advanced technology, advanced metal, it didn't come from our planet. It means it had to have come from somewhere else. So there's a lot of evidence out there to show that there are ETs. We are working with them or we're, we're con connecting with them. And, um, but they're behind the scenes for the moment. Have you researched the pyramids? And if so, what do you think they were used for? Okay. So I think the pyramids had multiple uses. Um, and I definitely, you can see that within the, the ancient text, you can see that the mystery schools use them for initiation. And this then indicates that there's a multidimensionality around it. 
So for initiation, there has to be, we have to be talking about subtle energy portals, that type of thing. And the people who go into the pyramids and do meditations there, they do tend to go off to, you know, they feel like they're, they're traveling to different places. Astral travel is much easier there. But I think that the main um, purpose for the pyramids, and it could be that they were actually originally built and then they were repurposed because I think that our civilization, civilization has actually gone back millions and millions and millions of years. It's just that 8,000 years ago, a Catholic event wiped out everything and we had to start again. But the pyramids stayed. The sacred sites, they stayed as well. They didn't get um, crushed like everything else did. And I think the pyramids were energy generators. And um, we can see this because the, the fact that they're, they're all following energy ley lines around the earth, and they're all built on places where ley lines cross. And where the ley lines cross, these are portals. And they use the high crystal content stone to create them. And that high crystal content, because you can channel, they basically are transducers for, transducers for energy crystals. That's what they do. And so the, the high crystal content, it like magn um, magnifies the energy from the ley line, from the cross the ley line. And then it rips, it like rips the electromagnetic field and, and it allows you to cross between dimensions. So this I think is really, really interesting, but it's, it's also, you've got the, the portal on the portals following the ley lines, the ley lines themselves also act as energy, energy links up, energy link ups. And then you've got 5,000 pyramids all around the world, most of which are actually in China. We know very little about these, but they're all over the world and they all link up. And I think that these were energy generators. And when you look at the, the, um, the old world buildings with the, you know, like the, um, the old churches and cathedrals and things, and you look at the, the churches and cathedrals and how they didn't actually have electricity, but they still had these wires, these electric wires, come, or these uh, metal wires coming in. And you can see that, I think that, that there, were, there was a civilization before us who actually were using free energy. And I think that they were siphoning in it from the, the, the ether. And I think that the pyramids are also energy generators as well. And there is a... Um, a, an idea that when we get free energy back again, because we did have it and we will get it back, then um, these pyramids will also be activated and we'll be able to then tap back into whatever these pyramids were able to do. And I think they probably have multiple uses, but yes, they, I think they were definitely an energy generators as well. If we go back to signs and symbols, I believe you write about how even Confucius talked about them and that they rule our world. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So Confucius, so he lived um, around 500 BC. And um, the secret societies can be traced back, you know, I mean, thousands of years, which means that they were further back than him. So he talks about how our world is governed by signs and symbols, not rules and laws. And I think what he meant by that were two things. One, we're talking about a holographic universe, a holographic reality, which is made up of sacred geometry, sacred geometric shapes, which of course is mathematics. Now there are many, many scientists that talk about the universe being, it's, it's, it's basically maths, you know? It's made up of numbers. These numbers then make up um, sacred geometry. And um, for example, runes as well, you know, runes, they, they are actually supposed to be like magic tablets, but what they mean by magic is advanced technology. And I think we are moving towards the idea that we're living in a hologram, a holographic reality, which I think is how we're able to be hijacked so easily because it's a holographic reality created by the mind and someone that knows how to tap into that can you know tap into it so the signs and symbols are actually making up this holographic reality and if you like changing the symbol changes the reality and i think many of these symbols were possibly even 
acting as you know nuclear codes or something you know like for example the seven tablets the seven tablets of destiny or the MEs that they talk about in the Sumerian tablets they talk about these symbols and these symbols have got great power it, it, it gives them the advanced abilities that they have what how could symbols give them advanced abilities unless it's not changing the holographic field in some way so I think as we move forward and understand more about this and as the information comes out and, um, you know, from the secret societies as well, we'll start to understand more about symbolism and how these different symbols are very powerful. I mean, there's a reason why Hitler took the, the swastika. It's actually one of the oldest symbols and considered one of the most powerful sacred symbols. And there's a reason why he took that, because that gave him the power of the symbol. And the cross as well, I think, you know, these different symbols that were taken. If we could just find the key to these symbols so we know how to use them, it would be amazing. Yeah, and I think that this technology will come out because the secret societies are still using them. So unless either they don't know what they're using, which I don't think is the case, or they do know what they're using, and if they do, then as this starts to unravel and things start to come out, then we will start to learn more and more about this. Do you believe that humanity has been lied to for thousands of years? And if so, in your opinion, what are the biggest lies? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think thousands of years, but I, I don't really have much evidence of that. I, I only can trace it back 120 years, definitely. Um, thousands of years, yeah, probably, because if you're thinking about the Babylonians, the Sumerians, money comes from Babylon, you know, and you just look at sort of what money has, has you know, is, is doing in our world. And um, I'm not, you know, they're actually money is just an energy. It, it doesn't have any importance on it at all. It's just a, a currency. But you can see how easily it can be hijacked. And in fact, many of the, um, what people call magic spells, but it's symbolism. Many of these symbols have been connected to money to pull the money back round to the elites. So we haven't been able to access this money because they've had all these spells, which is just energy. It's tapping into the energy fields. That's what we call spells. When you know that mind directs energy and then you use the, the, the symbols in order to harness that, then you can pull the energy around to you. And that's how they've managed to you know, become multi-trillion zillionaires. And, you know, they're always pulling the money back to them. But again, these are being dismantled as well. You have a book behind you titled Work Your Energy. Can you give us tips for manifesting? Yeah, well, it is all about resonance. So everything in the universe is frequency. Whatever frequency we are, that is we, we, the resonance of us. And we are attracting that frequency to us. So we're attracting, you know, frequency, energy, we're attracting those to us. So we manifesting, if you like, is all about the mind, but it's the heart as well. And I think Joe Dispenza sums this up best because it's the heart-mind coherence, which the Heart Math Institute have been studying for more than 20 years now. So manifesting is a heart-mind thing. And that's the bit where we've got it wrong, I think, is that we've always, we've believed that it's that our mind is the most powerful thing, that we can, we can just wish for something to happen, it will happen, but it doesn't. It's the heart and, the, and it's around intention. So everything is around intention. It starts with intention and then the mind directs the energy and the heart uh, pushes the energy out. And so our bodies are actually incredible manifesting vehicles essentially and that's how we're creating our reality all the time but we also have beliefs in there belief structures and there are certain beliefs that we've been taught that are not helping us and there are certain beliefs that we have probably collectively taken on as our own from our ancestors because they're epigenetically passed down through generations they're passed down to us in our in our dna so we've inherited the epigenetic memories from our parents and their parents and their parents going back like 40, 100 generations. And that's where the problem comes in. And that's why people are not able to manifest properly what it is that they want. You have to work on your belief structures and you have to set 
intentions that resonate with your heart and feel good. So you can't want a Ferrari because your mind wants a Ferrari because you want to be better than all your friends because that's it's just not going to manifest. You have to want a Ferrari because your heart truly wants to experience what it's like to drive a Ferrari, you know? So it's all about intention and then resonance. And it all comes from the heart. The heart is far more powerful than the brain and always has been. And this is another thing that we haven't been told the truth about as well. The heart has been relegated to cheesy romance movies, but actually the heart is the most powerful part of the human body. It's the most powerful part of us. And we all have traumatized hearts. And that's the problem. So you need to work on opening up your heart, becoming more compassionate and empathic again, or empathetic again. And, you know, becoming that loving, caring human being that the, that the human is. And that's when you're able to then manifest the reality, the life that you want. What other untapped abilities do we have as species and how do we switch them back on? So they're switching back on for many people now. And I'm getting more and more people messaging me saying, I can feel energy, I can sense energy, you know, I can feel things around me and I don't understand what's going on. And that that's, you know, and then, so I'm saying to them, well, it's because your DNA is activating, you're, you're switching, you know, you're becoming your true self again and your DNA is, is switching back on. And as we do this, we're becoming aware of the energy fields around us. We're becoming um, more aware of the, you know, even the other dimensions around us. And um, I think we're becoming aware of a much more expanded, wider world. Many more people, their mind sight is switching on. So um, I also do remote viewing as well. And, you know, you're, you're using your mind sight, your, your energy, your feelings, you're using all your senses in order to navigate the, the energy field. And, um, you know, things like levitation, uh, telekinesis, there've always been people in our history that can do these sorts of things. So all these things will start to switch on for all of us eventually. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they contact you? Of course, of course. Yeah. So you can uh, contact me so you can... Um, send me an email to elizabeth at ruthelizabethhancock.com and I'll send you the link for that. And they can ask me any questions they want. And you can also go to my website and learn more about my books and what I do. And that's ruthelizabethhancock.com as well. And as I mentioned in the beginning, you have a second book that's coming out, but it's not ready yet, right? Yeah, it'll be out in about two weeks. I was hoping it'll be out by now, but there's been delays but in around two weeks, I think it will be out. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want people to know about? Well, I teach intuitive development. Um, so we have the next cohort starting in September the 12th. And we're doing a, a free webinar on the 5th of September, which you can sign up for on my website as well. And um, that is essentially, we're going to teach people how to read the energy of a crystal. And it's much easier than you think because we're reading energy all the time anyway. We just don't know that we're doing it. What prompted you to write this new book? Yeah, well, yeah, it's certainly quite different to my first book. Um, and you know what? I, I worked with a shaman because I wanted to learn how to channel. And it's because I really felt like someone was trying to tell me something. And I didn't know who or what or anything like this. And it was just this feeling. You know, you just get these feelings and so I worked with this shaman and I've been channeling, you know, for around four years, um, actually, no, six years. And, you know, I think it's very interesting. It's not as scary as people think, but I think most of the information is just information from the collective. You know, we're just downloading it from the collective. But sometimes you get these little pearls of, of um, wisdom. And then what I always do is I feel into my heart and I think, is that my truth? Or am I just picking up someone else's truth here? And I just had this real feeling that my ancestors were trying to connect with me. And I also, hand on heart, feel that my ancestors did not come from this planet. And they were trying to tell me that this, is, this planet is, is not what you think it is. 
this reality is not what you think it is. We didn't come from this, we're not evolved apes. We came from a different planet. We came here and, and you know, we settled here and we were living with many other different races and species and we were all living together, but something happened and the planet got shut down, switched off or whatever it may be. And I felt like this, is, this was the story that they wanted me to, to talk about, to write about. So I'm a researcher at heart. So I started researching it. And I found so much information. There really is so much information. And it really helped me to then connect back to the truth of you know, my own heart and my feeling that, yeah, I do think that we came here from a different planet. I think we came here from Pleiades and we settled here. And I think that there have always been malevolent races and benevolent races. And I think the races are off planet, on planet, inside planet, outside planet, you know, Earth is is not as little as we as we've been led to believe either. I think that there are civilizations living inside the Earth, and um, and you know there are other civilizations living off in other other what we call planets, but even other dimensions as well. And I think that's what they wanted me to write about. That you know we are far bigger than we've been led to believe. We are much more expanded. We are unlimited. You know, we are energetic, multidimensional beings, and somewhere along the, the along the line, we've been shut down from accessing that truth. And and they're sort of saying to me, "We need you to know that truth again." Do you think that there are ETs walking among us that we can't recognize? Yes. Yeah, because the and it's the Indian Vedas that talk about this. They say that there are four hundred thousand human humans, basically human races in this galaxy alone, you know, and the Vedas, I mean, it's a huge, huge amount of work and I haven't read them all by any means, but it's very interesting what they talk about because they also say that this, that, that our world goes back millions and millions of years, at least 4 million. And um, when you think about it, it doesn't make any sense that our planet has been here for such a long time. And yet we've been around for what, 200, 300,000 years. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And then we look at these pyramids and these, you know, these sacred sites and things, and they say that they date back 5,000 years ago. Oh, it doesn't, it's just crazy to think that that's the case. So yeah, I think there are ETs living among us. I think most of them look like us because we are, I think, ETs as well. And I think that there are also hybrids as well. And, um, you know, I think most ETs are really benevolent. I think there's like a handful that aren't. But when you think about our world, most people are really nice, loving, caring people. But then there's a handful of people who aren't. And they've been trying to control and suppress us. And I think it's the same probably out there as it is in here as well. Elizabeth, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? I want people to know how incredible, amazing, and unlimited they are. And I really, I hate to see people suffer or struggle in this world. I really do. And I want people to know that the future is looking so amazing. The, you know, the karmic uh, matrix, the cycle, all this was dismantled 2019. We're moving into such an amazing future, however chaotic it looks out there. It's, it's not real. It's not true. It's just being designed to keep us stuck in fear or whatever it may be. But we're going to be moving into free energy. We're going to be um, having like, we're going to have new technologies, off-planet new technologies are coming in. The telecommunications will be changing from electromagnetic or harmful radiation to quantum. Uh, again, the financial systems going from the fiat, the corrupt fiat, which is you know, the black magic corrupt fiat one to quantum financial systems. The, we're going to be able to um, work with the weather, change the weather, because we can already do that anyway. So we can create um, a more like hospitable planet so we can actually spread out across the planets and stop being stuck into tiny cities and you know, living on top of each other. We'll be able to clean the oceans, which I know is something they're working on now. We've also got lots of humanitarian projects and there's a lot of funding for that because the money has been taken off the elites and it's going to be, is being used. It's already started being used to create these new projects, you know, to help these different countries. And um, 
you know, and things are just looking so amazing. You know, education is going to be completely altered and changed. It's going to work with the children rather than teaching them a regimented, you know, this, learn this, learn this, learn this. And I think we will also have the opportunity to be able to go off planet. And I think this is what our ancient ancestors did. I think that they went off planet and that's why they... There are so many signs of that, you know, that they actually went off the planet themselves and went to different planets and, and you know, went out there because I don't think that we can, we don't just travel in rockets. Well, we don't travel in rockets anyway, but we don't just travel in spacecraft. We can actually walk through portals, you know, we'll be able to teleport. The transport systems will change as well because we'll have free energy. We won't have the fossil fuels. I mean, just so much is coming. I don't know how long it will take, but it's it's all coming in. And we're going to get back the world that we should have had when all this was suppressed a hundred a hundred so years ago. Elizabeth, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. Thank you very much. It's been really, really great. I've so enjoyed this. Thank you. <laughs> Me too. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.